All right, well, let's get started. Welcome everyone to the third session of the 2021 Greenbelt Home Tour webinar series. My name is Katie Kalusny. I'm the Associate Director at the Illinois Green Alliance. Illinois Green is so excited to be hosting this next session, um, how to prioritize sustainability upgrades for an all electric home. We're really excited about our speakers we're having today and our moderator, um, but first I'm gonna start with a few logistics about the webinar today and a little bit more about Illinois Green. So first of all, if you're having any issue seeing the speaker, um, each speaker as they're talking, you can switch out of Eventbrite and log right into the Zoom link, which was in the reminder email from Eventbrite as well. Um, we'll also drop it into the chat um, just so that you guys have a, um, access to, to view everyone in the full screen view in case that's giving you any trouble in Eventbrite. Um, second, we're recording today's session, so we'll send out um, some links um, for more information on what we'll talk about today, as well as continuing education credit, anything you need to self-report. Um, for your credentials, um, as well as um, the recording for today's session, if, if you missed anything or you wanted to revisit any of the um, items that were presented. So next, I'm going to go talk a little bit more about Illinois Green. Um, Illinois Green Alliance is a membership-driven nonprofit organization that advances green buildings and sustainable communities for all. Um, our recently launched five-year strategic plan pushes the green building industry to meet or get on the path to net zero. And we achieve this work through educational events such as panels and building tours, such as today's event, engaging with communities and partnering with organizations across Illinois, and by advocating for new policies and legislation that advance our mission. Um, the Greenbelt Home Tour is one of Illinois Green's um, most almost longest running programs. The Greenbelt Home Tour began in 2013 um, by a group of volunteers that are passionate about green homes and increasing demand for high performance homes in Illinois. And through weekend tours, Q&A with homeowners and builders and online resources, the Greenbelt Home Tour strives to make it accessible to see the benefits of a green home for everyone. Last year and, and this year, Greenbelt Home Tour has switched to a virtual format to keep our community safe. Um, and following today's webinar, there are two more events in the series on September 8th and September 15th. Um, and two that were previous to this session um, that you can find on our website, greenbelthometour.org, um, if you missed either of those sessions and want to check back. Um, next, I wanted to just thank our sponsors, um, the Chicago Association of Realtors, Mitsubishi Electric, and the Common Energy Efficiency Program, um, who are supporting the series um, and make all of our events like this possible. Um, and also for our partners, the um, ISIF, which is one of our um, grant funders that support this program for many years, um, AIA Illinois, the Southwest Suburban Home Builders Association, Seven Generations Ahead, and the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, and the Green Home Institute. And I also want to thank our task force who helped to recenter this series around net zero and show lots of different types of projects um, throughout our five sessions in the series this summer. Um, next, I want to turn it over to um, the ComEd Energy Efic Efficiency Program and Kellen McSweeney to talk about um, the ComEd program that this uh, session is about, All Electric Homes. So Kellen, let me turn it over to you. She's also gonna be our fearless moderator for the rest of today's session. Thanks so much, Kellen. Thank you so much, Katie. And thanks everyone for joining us today and being with us for an hour and a half of your afternoon. So as Katie said, my name is Kellen McSweeney and I work on ComEd's um, All Electric Homes New Construction Offering. And that's a part of ComEd's Energy Efficiency Program. So I'm gonna give a brief rundown of the program and then we're gonna move on to our two speakers for the day. So if you're unfamiliar with the ComEd Energy Efficiency Program, it really encompasses all types of offerings for all of their customers, small, large, rural Illinois, downtown Chicago, um, whether you're a homeowner just looking for rebates for your appliances or a builder looking for incentives for your large industrial or manufacturing building, um, that all exists. So I really urge you to check out ComEd's website for more information about all of the different offerings that you could take advantage of. Next slide. So uh, today I'm gonna talk to you about the Electric Homes New Construction Program. Obviously that is the theme of this. So we launched this program in 2020 um, and we were really aiming to help builders achieve high performance all electric homes. And even though the offering says new construction, it is for both new construction 
or major renovation. And so this slide kind of outlines the holistic package of energy efficiency measures required to participate. And you can see there in bold, uh, there is a $2,000 incentive per home um, for achieving these requirements. And so uh, a quick rundown on these, we start by focusing on a tight envelope, and then we move into those high efficiency heat pumps and heat pump water heaters. And from there, we're really talking about those Energy Star appliances, um, efficient plumbing fixtures, LED lighting, smart thermostats, all of the things you're used to hearing about for an efficient home. Um, so, so that's a quick rundown, but you can find a lot more information and details on these different requirements on the website. Um, I have some links that are going to be shared in the chat and then also at the end of my slides as well. So you can, you can find that in a little, in a little bit. Um, but a, a, bit, a little overview about program participation. So it's really straightforward. Um, what that looks like is you would submit an application um, to us along with any drawing, specs, whatever, whatever you have available there. And then we're gonna just check in with you throughout the construction, check in on how things are going, um, see what the timeline looks like, if anything has changed there. Um, and we're also there to help you engage with um, any, anyone else that can help you along with your project, whether that is a, another building maybe you have some questions, or perhaps a home energy rater. So we do require a blower door test uh, at some point during the, the project and um, not an entire HERS report, but we can connect you with that home energy rater if that's someone you haven't worked with before. Um, so, so after all of that, you know, you go through construction, the project is complete, we might do a site verification, make sure all the requirements were met, and then uh, the incentives are paid out. So really straightforward process, and uh, we hope to engage with with your future projects as well. Katie, you can go to the next slide. So in my opinion, one of the most exciting aspects of these all electric homes is the opportunity to offset that energy use with renewables and move toward net zero, which is of course um, kind of the theme of the home store this year. So these are not requirements for the program um, going net zero, but we do highly recommend them. Um, you know, you can offset those energy costs for the long run as well. So as many of us know, a lot of advancements in heat pumps and solar and electric vehicles present these new opportunities for both the builder and the homeowner to move towards uh, more net zero buildings. And Comet is really interested in supporting that big picture approach to these high performance homes. And so I have a, just a handful of resources listed here, um, whether you're interested in solar, electric vehicles, load management in your home. Again, there's tons of resources on the Comet website, so you can check that out for yourself as well. Next one for me, Katie. Oops, sorry, I did not realize there was a double click there. <laughs> so this is just a map, wanted to give you a snapshot of where we are currently working with homes, both that we completed last year during the program and then also some um, over the next few years in our pipeline. Of course, um, ComEd is most of Northern Illinois, which is larger than this map. Um, so if you have projects elsewhere that aren't in this little snapshot, we would still love to work with you. We're hoping to expand our footprint um, even further in combat service territory. Next, Katie. So we haven't wrapped 2021 yet, so I wanted to share photos of our 2020 projects um, and the participating homes. You can see there are a mix of single family homes all the way up to three flats. And we also saw a variety in both custom build and speculative builds. But more importantly, um, as you heard me kind of mention already, we worked with really, really fantastic builders. And they're excited about these projects, excited about their innovative solutions they're coming up for these different homes. Um, and so if you're interested in speaking to a past or current participant, um, of course, uh, joining these webinars is a great way to do that because a lot of the builders have participated, but also you can reach out to myself or my colleague and we can connect you to those builders as well if you have any questions. Next one, Katie. So really briefly, I'm going to go through some of the requirement, some of the requirements in a little more detail. I'm sure Tom and Jeff are going to talk about their project specifics much more detailed than I will, but just a few of the main component components. So as I mentioned, we start with that air tightness. So this is a huge opportunity for energy savings and increased comfort. And there are really a variety of ways of how projects um, have accomplished this and how they can accomplish this for their, for their home. So these are just a few examples of what we saw. You can see on the left, the, the blue mesh in the middle is that zip wall. And then we have spray foam as well. So 
tons of different uh, ways to figure this out for your project and figure out, you know, what method is going to be the best for what your needs are and what your goals are. Next slide, please. And for mechanicals, I want to touch on a few um, different things that we have seen in the program. It all starts with this outdoor unit um, on the left there. And so if you haven't seen one there, that is your air source heat pump. And from there, we've typically seen either air handler units, um, which is similar to your typical forced air home that's on the top in the middle, or a mini split like the one in the bottom middle. And so for a lot of projects, using some sort of combination of those, both the air handling unit and the mini split, that really allows for the flexibility to solve any zoning um, needs that a project could have, um, just allows for a lot of flexibility to solve whatever your problems are um, and meet your goals there. Um, and I think you can do one more click, Katie, and that should be the heat pump water heater. Um, and that really looks like a typical water heating tank. It runs on electricity, though. So overall, you can see that um, these technologies, they're not that much different than what you're used to seeing in a typical gas, um, gas home. And a lot of these technologies have gotten really advanced um, over the years to even work in these cooler climates like Illinois. Even though it's 90 degrees, it does not feel like we're in a cooler climate now. But we know the winters come and it's very cold. But these technologies have come a long way um, and they can be used even here. I think there's next one, Katie. So a few other configurations I'll just run through really quickly to see the different flexibility. So this um, is a single family home. It had an outdoor unit, an air handler, and a mini split on the inside, um, and then also a heat pump water heater as well. Go to the next one. And so this project had uh, the air source heat pump connected to two different air handlers on the inside that you can see. And they also had a slightly different approach to the water heating. They used an outdoor unit split system water heater. So again, tons of flexibility. I think I have one more of these examples. Yeah, so this is a three flat project. It had three outdoor units and then three different air handlers on the inside. And they were able, act able to actually meet their water heating needs um, with two heat pump water heaters. So as I mentioned, tons of flexibility. You'll, you'll see between Tom and, and Jeff too, you know, they've done things in different ways to meet their needs and to still go all electric and high performance. So there's a lot of different options out there for you for whatever your project is going to be. Next slide. So I will quickly wrap up. I want to share some other resources that you can find on ComEd's website. If you are a builder looking for um, HVAC contractors, I would check out this residential service provider list on ComEd's website. You, I think you can even search for um, contractors that work specifically with or sorry, heat pumps if that's something um, you need some assistance on. So that's a really great re resource. And we also have a few internal lists that are not on ComEd's website. Um, I mentioned home energy Raiders. We have a list of folks that we have worked with um, and who know the program if you need to get connected to a home energy rater. And we also have a really great list of contacts of representatives from different manufacturers of heat pumps and heat pump water heaters. And so if you're just interested in learning more about the equipment or have some questions for Mitsubishi or Bosch or whomever, um, we very likely have a contact for you that you could reach out to and they can help you for your project as well. So definitely reach out to us um, and we can get you connected. Next slide, Katie. Oh, last thing I wanted to share is uh, on ComEd's website, there is some information and more resources on understanding uh, solar and rebates and what the potential could be for your project. So again, it's all on the website. Check that out um, and, and see if maybe solar is a, is a good opportunity for your program or for your project. Next slide, Katie. Yep, that's it for me. Um, again, if you have questions, interest in learning more about the program, please do not hesitate to reach out to myself. I've also included my colleague Sophia's information down there. Please reach out to us. We're happy to talk to you more and tell you about the program and hear about your project. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this webinar. I'm going to send it over to Tom right now from Tom Bassett Daily Architects. And Tom, uh, take it away. Introduce yourself and take us through your project. Thank you, Carolyn. And I, Illinois Green, um, I'm here sweating in my basement just in case we want to have a look around. But um, before we uh, get into the specifics of my presentation, 
I wanted to um, talk a little bit about uh, this um, this flowchart idea that we that we put together with uh, Illinois Green and myself. Um, <clears throat> I need to figure out how to uh, navigate between my tabs here. Um, sorry, guys. Uh, give me one second. I'm, I need to get to a, a tab that I can't. I can't see. I'll try it this way. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about electrification, and uh, a lot of times that will deal with um, <clears throat> complex issues of retrofitting and changing out appliances and equipment. And the more I started thinking about it, and the more projects I did like that, uh, I realized that you know it's kind of complicated. It might be nice to sort of write down the ideas. So. Um, we wrote them down and I put them in this blog post here that you can find on my website. Um, and, and then talked to, to Katie and Maggie and Ashley at Illinois Green about it. And they said, hey, we, uh, we have an intern. <laughs> we, could, um, we could actually uh, create a more user-friendly version of this. And I said, well, that'd be great because um, you know, what, we, what we did here initially was just trying to chart the path and it is, very intertwined and connected. So just to give you a quick, a quick view on it, um, the big 30,000 foot view as I see it in an ideal scenario is let's say you want to take your old fossil fuel burning house and turn it into a all electric, energy efficient, comfortable house. Um, maybe you take it as far as passive house, maybe you don't. But um, so what do you do and what order do you do it in? The ideal, in my opinion, is to start with the roof and then move to the walls and, you know, any sort of floors that are suspended, like I have porch floors that need to be dealt with. Um, and then basement. And then once you've done those three, you've basically done the thermal envelope. And then you move into your mechanicals, your HVAC system. Um, and then you offset it with solar at the end. Um, I'm sorry. And there's, you know, step five appliances, water heating, so swapping out all of your gas appliances for electric. Um, and so as you start to go through there, as a homeowner, you might say, all right, so you want me to upgrade my roof? How should I do it? So I tried to create this, um, this kind of walkthrough to say, well, is it, let's start with your attic. Is it, is it, is your attic unheated or is it a heated attic? Um, well, uh, it's unheated. So, okay, is it insulated? No. Well, okay, air seal it from the house, et cetera, et cetera. So this is kind of like just step by step. Um, so I'm going to click over to this tab, which is a much more user-friendly version of it. Um, so uh, check it out after we do this. Um, and what's great about this document that Illinois Green put together is that um, when I did mine, I didn't include all the definitions and all the stuff that's kind of under the hood you don't know. So like vented attic, what does that mean? Well, here, you know, if you click on this link here, it'll take you to a document that talks about it, it gives you some background information. And you say, no, I don't have a vented, vented attic. So you go to question four. Um, and so, all right, does that mean you have a cathedral ceiling or a flat roof, et cetera? So, um, so check this out, give us your feedback. Our intention was that this would be a living document and as people start to to do these projects and react to it, they'll have different ideas, and we can upgrade this. So, um, I hope that's I hope that's helpful for people. Okay, um, I hope you can see my PowerPoint now. Yep. And I'm assuming so. Thank you. Um, all right. So, my uh, does anybody know how I can move the tab, uh, the the sort of control panel of the zoom control panel at the top of my screen, move it to a different part of my screen. <laughs> if you put your, if you click on it and drag it, you should be able to drag it. Oh, I sure can. Thank you. Perfect. Welcome. Great. Thank you. Thank you. You'd think that would just be intuitive, right? My son wouldn't have thought twice. He would have just done it. Um, all right. So uh, here's my house. This is the picture I took yesterday. Uh, we finally made a little sign that we're going to put in front of all of our decarbonization projects. Um, and so I want to tell you about what we're doing and um, and kind of the how and why of it. Um, let's see if I can click back in the PowerPoint so I can advance. Here we go. All right. So I'm Tom Bassett-Dilly. I'm an architect and a passive house consultant. Um, I started my firm in 2006. 
to really go after this kind of stuff. I was specifically interested in sustainability, and that led me to taking passive house training um, and becoming uh, Architecture 2030 signatory firm, which means that we're aiming for carbon neutral by 2030, which is, as we know, really, really ambitious. Um, this is an old staff photo. Unfortunately, two of those people have moved on and a new one's joined. Um, I am looking to hire. So if you're into this stuff, send me a resume. Um, so AIA 2030, just to touch on that really quickly, this is for architects to uh, think about what they're doing and measuring it. Um, and uh, it's, it's about getting to net zero carbon by 2030, but we're architects so it's doing it in the context of good design. So we wanna make a beautiful, and efficient uh, uh, environment that, that's healthy as well. Um, and really in order to do that as architects, we really need to know under, uh, building science, um, mechanical systems. Um, that's how we're gonna design and build this clean energy future. Um, for the last three years, my firm has achieved the 2030 targets of uh, right now we're at 80% uh, carbon reduction off of baseline. Um, so we're immensely proud of that. Um, and uh, part of the way, re the way we get there is by energy modeling. So we model in last year, more than 95% of our projects. So um, that gives us the knowledge to really know what's happening in our buildings. Um, here's a quick view of some of uh, most of the passive house or net zero buildings we've done since 2012 to 2020. We have about this many uh, in the works right now, passive houses and net zero from here, Kentucky, Wisconsin, Colorado. Um, so we're very excited to, to be sort of building this stuff. And then the lower right is the Franklin Wright House, the Oscar Balch House that we presented with Illinois Green last um, couple of weeks ago. So how that owner called us and said, I wanna make my house net zero. We're like, oh boy. So um, <clears throat> decarbonizing existing homes. I just wanna, I, I don't have a lot of time here. In fact, I'm gonna look at my time. It's 420, I need to finish up by uh, like 15 minutes max, I think here. So um, I know it's not a ton of time to tell you everything I did and thought about it, but I wanted to try to give some helpful insights uh, that I see as an architect and a homeowner going through it um, to try to get some guidance and context to this stuff. Um, it can be complicated. There are pros and cons. I don't want to just sort of do, hey, isn't this great? But actually, you know, what are some things you're going to want to have to think about? Um, so once again, this snapshot here is kind of that idealized scenario. I'm kind of doing a lot of stuff at once on mine. Um, but just to talk about the pros and cons. So the pros of going all electric. Um, well, the first big thing, the definition of it is this, there are no more fossil fuels coming into your building, I should say, directly. There's still fossil fuels fueling the, some of the electricity that's coming our way. But the big picture is, if we can make our buildings more efficient, then we can feed them entirely with renewable energy. If we don't make our buildings more efficient, we're going to have to keep burning coal and gas in order to get enough electricity to power these things. So no more fossil fuels, and as Kellen said, we have the opportunity to offset the electricity with solar, and that's the path to net zero. Um, you can't have a net zero building that's burning gas because you can't offset the gas. But if it's electricity and you can offset it, then you can get there. Um, the second thing, which is kind of obvious, is that you don't have any more poisonous gas inside your home, um, which I got to tell you, I mean, I've thought about this and read about it. Rocky Mountain Institute has a great study they did last year about the toxins that come out of cooking with gas inside the house, and it's really eye-opening. Um, you don't want to cook with gas. <laughs> you don't want carbon monoxide in your building either, or the nitric oxide. I mean, all this stuff, right? It really hit home to me when the gas company came and pulled that out. I was like, wow, I don't have to worry about this anymore. You know, not, not just the poison, but going up in flames, you know, whatever, all this stuff that can happen with gas. And I don't have to pay the 30 something dollars a month, you know, for the privilege of having this thing in my house. So uh, let's get rid of the fossil fuels. Um, I get better indoor air quality immediately just because of taking away the gas. Um, because when you cook with gas, you make toxins. When you when you bring carbon monoxide into your gas into your house, you know it's you're, you're bringing toxicity in. So, um, but part of my project um, is the HVAC upgrade, which I'm sitting in the midst of, which is going to include. Uh, energy recovery ventilator, so I'm going to have even better air quality because because of that. Um, 
The other big pro, of course, with uh, a full retrofit, where you're dealing with the thermal envelope as well as the appliances and equipment, is you get better comfort, greater durability if you are really taking care of the, the skin of your house. Um, that's an opportunity to put flashings in correctly and making sure what's put on is going to be lasting. Uh, greater resilience. So if you have a better insulated house and the power goes out, um, you'll be more stable temperature wise for a longer period of time. Um, if you have an all electric house uh, you, that you can plug your car battery into, you can use your car battery as a backup. Um, you know, there's, there's ways of dealing with power outages uh, that are here or are coming um, that have to do with integrating our electrical systems that are really fascinating. Um, and because of that resilience, you have an increased sense of security. You know, not only just the gas isn't here anymore, but I feel like this is, this is working for me. Yeah, the power can go out. It's true. Um, but if you have solar and a backup battery, you may be able to have a, a backup generator or backup system that'll work, you know, without that. Um, you know, without worrying about losing your, your refrigerator or your ability to heat or cool. Um, and then finally, there is the potential for lower energy bills. And you'll see in this presentation, you don't necessarily do that if you just switch to electric, but the potential is there. What about the cons? Well, it cost me about 1500 bucks to get the gas company to come out and disconnect. So right away, there's like a boom, you know, it's like, we're sorry to see you go. Here's a bill for 1500. Um, <clears throat> And uh, of course, the other big thing, speaking of money, is that a full retrofit is expensive. I mean, and, and this, is, this is something we're gonna have to deal with and we have to deal with it fast because we have so many buildings that we have to retrofit and you know, not everybody's gonna wanna spend a hundred grand on like redoing all this stuff. But um, consider the service life of the equipment. If the furnace is gonna give out, well, then it would be good to replace it with a mini split, right? Or a heat pump. Yes, it's true. However, if your house is totally leaky and uninsulated, you better take care of that before you do the mini split or else you're going to have a hard time making your loads, perhaps. You know, it depends on your specific house. Um, so it has a lot to do with like the service life of equipment, um, the, your operating costs you're looking at, how you're going to fund it. Um, but that is one of the cons. It, it costs a lot of money. Uh, it can be inconvenient as I'm sitting here without air conditioning. I can tell you, <laughs> that, uh, you know, there are little things that, that can be annoying because uh, we didn't move out for this. Um, moving out is a bigger inconvenience for a lot of people, and it's impossible for uh, many, many people. You know, what do you think? I've got the money to rent something while I'm, you know, so um, so, so that's, that's an issue. Uh, another one is that you may need to upgrade your electrical panel. I did, and we'll be um, showing you that uh, in the presentation here. Uh, another another problem that we're getting into is um, there's a bit of a lack, lack of expertise in the construction field. Uh, I tried to get my heat pump water heater installed by calling my plumber. He's like, no, I won't do those. They, they don't work. I'm like, yeah, they do. We put them in a bunch of houses. What, what, what's wrong with you? You know. So I called another plumber, same thing. So it, it's like, how are we going to get the heat pumps if the contractors aren't going to install it? Well, I was really happy to see what ComEd is doing, keeping that contractor list together. So I'll be, I'll be hitting that more. Um, but the general contractors I work with kind of have those people. Um, there is a homeowner learning curve for different HVAC operation uh, using induction cooking. Um, so that these are things to, to realize are coming up. Your house is going to act differently and you're going to have to act differently in your house sort of. Um, change can be hard for some people. Um, I kind of get excited by it, but, um, but even so, I mean, the first time I cooked eggs on my induction cooktop, <laughs> I burnt them. So, you know, you got to get used to that little setting. Um, and then finally, assessing the building science and the work order to figure out how to do this on projects is tricky. It requires specialty knowledge and, and therefore design expense. Um, be, because th these are tricky and you can do these in phases, but you have to phase it right. And that takes a lot of construction knowledge and takes design knowledge. Um, I'm hoping that what we do is build up a case study of a lot of these and that you have a sort of a, a boilerplate if you've got a brick two flat um, or if you've got a brick bungalow or a frame bungalow like mine. Um, so uh, so this is something that, that just has to be dealt with. And, and 
I bring up the cons partly to think about if we're going to accelerate this retrofit kind of idea, electrification, maybe we need incentives to pay, you know, three thousand dollars to upgrade an electric panel or and fifteen hundred to do the gas. And right off the bat, before you even started, you're six grand in, you know. So, um, okay, let's get in. Uh, okay, one one more uh, wordy slide, sorry, and then it's going to be pretty pictures, I promise. Uh, kind of guiding questions. Uh, first one is, is your major equipment near the end of its service life? So when your range gives out, you can swap over to induction cooktop or induction range. Um, you got to get an electrician out to give you a 240 to connect it to it. But, um, you know, so, so factor that into the cost. Uh, when your water heater gives out, you can definitely go uh, heat pump water heater. You can find the plumber to put it in. Um, furnace and AC, like we talked about. The other one is our major services surfaces near the end of their service life. So my soffits and fascias were falling off. Um, the squirrels were getting in. The squirrels are really the reason I'm here talking to you today. Um, and so I said, all right, if I'm going to be dealing with the exterior, I can go ahead and strip off my asbestos insulation with an asbestos remediator. And I can retrofit insulate the exterior of my house and do it right, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. I don't know if that's the right expression at this moment. But um, you get the picture. If your inside is ruined, like we've retrofitted some projects where, it, you know, people were letting it kind of go to ruin on the inside. They said, all right, we'll just strip this stuff off and we'll insulate from the inside. The exterior is in good shape. So think about that, how that can, that can fit in. Um, and then I guess my big questions are always, is what I'm going to do making this healthier, more comfortable, more energy efficient? You, you want to be hitting two of those usually on most, on most decisions. Um, uh, I should say energy efficient usually doesn't do it just by itself, you know, but is it more energy efficient and healthier, you know? Um, but retrofits can usually do simultaneous benefits. You know, you can really find solutions that hit many of these at once. Um, about cost, we've talked about some of the costs you're into right up at front. Um, return on investment, I think is extremely difficult to predict and impossible to generalize. Uh, my decision was not whether it would pay off in the next number of years, but can I afford it? Can I afford the payment, really, um, if I borrow the money? And of course, money was so cheap that uh, my monthly uh, mortgage went up by about $200, but I borrowed over 100 to do all of the work that I'm doing. So what is that work and why? how did I figure it out? Um, so I did energy modeling on this, and um, I, I started with, can I make this a passive house? And I ran into some real problems because I'd already done the roof, and I didn't do the roof well enough. And I'd already done the windows, you know, years ago. The windows probably have at least another five years, probably 10 years in them. So I, I was like, well, I can't make passive house with those windows and that roof, but I can make the passive house source energy, the total energy consumption. Can I make that? I asked myself. And, and so I did the energy modeling and figured out, yeah, I can. In fact, I can do way better than it. Um, and I can make this house way more comfortable and all electric, et cetera. So what I bought 20 something years ago was a typical old house, uninsulated, leaky with inefficient fossil fuel, uh, HVAC and appliances. And so therefore most, most of the energy, like 80% of the energy that came to this house went straight through the walls. It went straight through the flu. You're just wasting energy. It's astonishing. So uh, first thing I did um, was insulated the roof. And this was years ago. Uh, spray foamed it. Um, and that puts an air seal cap on the building. So it sort of slows down the stack effect or almost stops it. Um, and that cut my energy down by like 28%, boom, just like that. Um, I did make a mistake. I used open cell uh, spray foam. I should have used closed cell. It was 2014. There was debate about it. I thought I was doing the right thing. It's not catastrophic, but I would have been better off with the spray foam. Just better air seal, a little better R value. Um, so that was number one. What does that look like? Well, crawling into the attic up on the upper right, you can see they sprayed it, you know, it expanded like that. It makes a pretty good seal. I mean, it's really sticky stuff. And uh, Chicago Green Installation did it, and they did a really good job. 
um, diligent with, you know, filling in all the cracks. And then you can see the picture from a couple of days ago, looking up at the eaves. When they sprayed it down to the eaves, they filled that whole thing. It just, it just, it's goofing out there a little bit. So when we take our blue skin, which is that air tightness, air barrier on the outside of our wall, up, we're going to take that last course up, and then we're going to use closed cell foam to kind of glue those two together. Um, so the next thing to do, if you can, is the walls. Um, so like I said, ours were um, starting to fall off, um, and we needed to deal with the exterior skin. <clears throat> and so um, we said, okay, you know what? If we strip it down to sheathing, then we can drill holes in the sheathing on the outside, pump in cellulose, and then we can put an air barrier up, and then we can put continuous insulation on it and really change the thermal performance of this house. Am I getting a time warning here, by the way? I heard a noise. Okay. You're good. Oh. Okay, thanks. So, um, there we go. Um, so, yeah, the walls are the biggest surface area. Um, they're not the biggest, well, and, there, and there's so much surface area that, that's full of holes that it's a big air, uh, air tightness issue as well. So, um, so when we attack this, you can see like, here's a picture of the house after we strip the siding. And there's this wonderful old wood. It's in actually beautiful shape, but um, it, it's shot full of holes and there's siding over the top of that. And of course there was asbestos siding over the top of that. Um, so when the wind blows, it just kind of works its way between the cracks, you know? Um, but look at that blue skin. You put that peel and stick membrane up and you get an air barrier, which is diffusion open. Um, and it's a moisture barrier from the outside as well. So it's a, it's a protective skin for my house. Um, we drilled that to make, um, to be able to put the cellulose in. So in the picture on the right, you can see the cellulose kind of sticking out of the holes that I was uh, spending last Saturday taping up. Um, so, so that's our wall in progress. And like I said, I have the camera here. If anybody wants to see anything up close, I can walk around and look at it. Um, on top of that blue skin, which has the cellulose behind it, uh, we're putting up this wood fiberboard insulation. So, um, you know, we've done a lot of projects with foam, like uh, the white styrofoam you've seen it on our passive house projects on the Greenbelt tours over the years. And uh, we're trying to avoid it as much as we can. And we're trying to use wood as much as we can. And the wood fiber board is uh, readily available now. You can go to 475 Supply or Global Wholesale Supply. We got the Styco from Global Wholesale. So this is like an R8 continuous wood fiber insulation. Um, so it's a thermal break outside of all of our studs. Uh, and um, it's a carbon negative material. So it's waste material that's turned into insulation. It's got a paraffin in it, so it's water resistant. You can leave it unexposed for like six months and you don't have to worry about moisture degradation. Um, we're gonna cover it with siding, of course. Um, so, uh, and then there's some tricky joints to make. I'm not gonna go into this too much, the mock-up uh, whatnot. Um, Eric Barton, uh, who you've met on uh, Greenbelt Home Tours in the past, um, is my general contractor. He's great, he's so diligent. Um, you can see like in the crawl space here, I mean, we got to connect the blue skin in all these awkward spaces and it's going in. Um, okay. And I'm just going to back up here and just say, um, looking at the, just the energy model, um, here we were at the, at the beginning with, um, you know, a furnace size of a hundred thousand BTU hour needed to heat and cool this place or to heat this place rather. And you know, once we did the roof, we brought that down to a 65,000 BTU hour. So that's a little more than a five ton. It's like you get a six ton system. Um, and then we do the walls and we're down at 26. I mean, we're like just over, we're, we're under three tons. So the size of the furnace that you need to buy shrinks uh, by a, a big substantial portion if you really can deal with insulation and air tightness. So, this is why we say do the thermal envelope first um, because you will not have enough roof area to offset the electricity that you're going to use with your heat pump 
if you don't insulate first. You, you won't be able to do it. You'll just be, you'll, you won't be net zero. Um, and then down here, after we do the basement, it goes down to 22.6. That's not a huge difference. We're not gaining a huge amount of energy um, bonus by doing the basement, but the slab was cracked. There was radon, there was moisture, there were centipedes. <laughs> it's like, you don't want that. It was not a space that I could feel good about. And every time over the last 20 years of owning this house, I would think about some great addition or something like that. I'd always come back to, yeah, but I got to take care of the basement. And so finally, after not doing anything for many years, because it was too expensive, I said, you know what, I'm just going to do the basement and take care of my thermal envelope. And in doing so, I can fix the back porch, which is like a, you know, a thermal disaster. And I can make that better. So I'm taking what I have and making it better. And now I'm going to have a basement that really is a nice basement to be in. Um, dry, warm, comfortable, and all that. So here's how we did it. We tore out the old slab, which was easy. You could do it with a crowbar practically. Um, it wasn't so easy putting it in buckets and carrying it to the dumpster, but you know, I didn't need to go to the gym that month. Um, and then uh, we laid down this vapor barrier. Uh, I'm sorry, we laid down the pink, uh, the pink foam, which I wanna say is good insulation, but bad blowing agent. This is XPS foam. We wanted to get the HFO blowing agent foam, but it was not available. So this is the, the, the stuff that's on the shelf now. So I'm embarrassed to say that I've got the pink foam under my uh, slab, but it's, it's what we could get. Um, there is a problem with availability of some things still. The better blowing agents are less global warming intensive. So we want to use those. Um, so anyway, a couple inches of foam under the slab, it's R10. And then the yellow, uh, we call Stego wrap, gets taped up onto the walls. And then the white on the side is uh, in so fast, that's a, that's a foam insulation. We gotta use foam below grade because it's in moisture contact with the, with the damp uh, foundation wall. Um, so, uh, so that goes down and then the slab on top of it. Um, finally, uh, after all that thermal envelope stuff is done, we change out the mechanical systems. And um, and it's interesting, you notice how the furnace size went from a 22.6 to a 23.8. That's because I'm ventilating. So I'm, I'm getting an ERV in here and ERVs bring in fresh air and extract um, you know stale air from the house. And so there's a little bit of an energy penalty you, you, you pay for that. Even though mine is the serve, the conditioning ERV. So it conditions the air as it comes in, so it doesn't feel cool when it's coming in, but it does take a little energy. Um, it's a nerdy point. We can, we can, if people have questions, we could talk about that later. But um, anyway, so yeah, got rid of the gas line, swapped everything out. Um, my dryer, my cooktop, my um, uh, water heater over there, um, and talked to Kellen and their team and uh, submitted all my specs and everything and qualified for the all electric homes incentive, which is, which is great. Um, and so here we are down at uh, an EUI, which is energy use intensity of 19.3. And then I put solar on and uh, where do I get to? Oh, well, here's some pictures of my, uh, my gear. So there's the, the Rheem Proterra 50 gallon heat pump water heater with a little mixing valve on it. We can talk about that. Uh, I already had the Bosch washer, which spins out really well, but I got the Bosch heat pump water, uh, dryer. I've been using it for about three weeks. It's fantastic. It is a little different if you don't set, so, some things will feel kind of slightly damp when you take them out. So there is a learning curve about using that. And then of course, got the Mitsubishi train uh, air handler here for first floor and basement. And then the serve, which my computer is sitting on right now, which is the ventilation system. I'm so excited. I can't wait to get this stuff hooked up, especially in days like today. Oh my God. Um, so I've got an electrical engineer friend um, and I talked to him after I ran this electrical uh, panel size calculator. I had made some mistakes on it. It looked to me like my required service is only 80 amps, but he corrected me on some things and got me up to 97.6 without the car charger, so I was like, okay, 100 amps isn't gonna cut it. So we bit the bullet and said, we, let's play it safe and upgrade to 200 amps. Uh, and that's even with everything super efficient. Um, like I put this little energy guide here. This is the one from my, my dryer. The dryer and the water here are the same. They give you this like 
least energy, most energy, and both of them are off the chart least. Like the minimum is 130. Well, this is at a 123. So, um, so even even super efficient, you know, LED lighting, et cetera, um, you know, it just adds up. And this is a relatively small house. So then I add solar, and I uh, actually did the solar uh, before the 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 uh, the federal credits went down below 30. So it was already it's already on there, and it's been working great. I plan to add probably four more panels, maybe eight, um, and I'll get close to net zero. But even without adding anything, I'm still below um, the FIAS source energy limit. So to put that in perspective, call this four people in the house because it's a three bedroom house. Um, it, that's 1900 kilowatt hours per person. And the target for FIAS, that's the Passive Thoughts Institute US, is uh, about 3400 kilowatt hours per person. So we're doing great for overall energy. We just can't make some of the, the metrics on the, the space conditioning criteria for, for passive house. All right, um, this is a slide that I showed uh, on the Balch House thing. And I'm just gonna touch on this a moment to say that the bottom, the bottom blue line is where you wanna be. You wanna retrofit for net zero or near net zero. You don't wanna tear down and build new because that just throws away a bunch of energy and uses a bunch of energy. Um, Here's some renderings of the house as it's gonna look with some wood cladding, some existing cladding showing, some metal cladding. I'm calling it a collage of old and new. Um, and uh, very quickly closing thoughts. Um, like I said before, most of the energy that arrives is wasted. And so conserve first and then electrify and add renewables. Um, except in some cases where equipment is being replaced, like your water heater just went out, you can go ahead and get that heat pump water heater. Fixing the thermal envelope isn't going to, you know, matter to that. Um, but have a plan for conservation. Think about when is going to be the right time to insulate my walls, insulate my roof, take care of my basement. We need literally hundreds of these a day in Chicago if we're going to meet the Paris Accord target. It's a stunning amount. We're so far behind. Um, and, it's, and it's complicated on single family homes because everyone's unique. Everyone has issues like mine was the windows and the roof and, you know, yours is, is the brick or something, you know. So we need a library of case studies to streamline decisions and speed this up. I'm working with some really inspired uh, clients right now in uh, Milwaukee and in Chicago to think about how do we um, satisfy the need for speed, as Andy likes to say. I think Andy, I saw his name on here, so I'm hoping he's on. Um, how, do we, how do we ramp this up? We need to we need to do more. So anyway, hoping sharing this stuff is is helping. Um, I have a resources list here, which is pretty nice, and I can put this in a document, send it to IGA to uh, share with with links. So um, with that, I'll pass it back to Kellen to introduce Jeff, our next speaker. Thanks so much, Tom. And if anyone has questions for Tom, please continue to put them in the Q and A box. We'll try to get to as many as we can at the end. And we'll also put together a Q&A document to be sent out afterwards. So hopefully you'll get, a, you'll get an answer either way. Um, so next up, we're going to have Jeff Spaulding. And he uh, retrofitted his project in Lincoln Square. He's going to tell us all about that. Uh, my name is Jeff Spaulding. And um, we just finished this res renovation. I was just going to kind of go through um, our process over the next 15 minutes and just kind of explain what we went through. Uh, we got two little kids, and last night was actually our, our first night in the house, so this presentation is kind of good timing. Uh, we kind of had the debate of, do we move to the suburbs where there's bigger yards and more schools or stay in the city? We were coming from a small apartment in uh, Edgewater and uh, found this two-flat in Lincoln Square. And it's like every other two-flat in Chicago. I mean, there's thousands of them. Um, it needed a little bit of work. Uh, just two bedrooms, tiny kitchen, uh, two floors. We, um, a lot of these get converted to single family homes and we decided to keep it as a two flat, um, take over two floors and have one of the units in the basement, um, mainly to keep more housing in the city. But probably the biggest reason was it helped with our expenses a little and just to have a little rental income. So we definitely had to focus on the basement as well, uh, just because that was going to be more living space. 
Um, we had to dig down about 10 to 12 inches in order to get eight, eight feet of ceiling. So that, that was probably the biggest challenge and the most work that took the most time with our project over the last 10 months or so. And originally the plan was to keep um, the steam boiler. I have always had steam heat in Chicago and I, I love that heat. Uh, the question is then how do you get air conditioning? And during the process, um, we just found that the existing layout of the steam radiators was kind of problematic. I talked to a lot of subs, not as many mechanical subs work on steam heat anymore. And it was just kind of costly to move the radiators everywhere. And that's when I kind of found out about the electrical program uh, through ComEd. And once you start considering getting your heating and cooling and focusing on the envelope, everything else is pretty easy like the induction cooktops and the heat pump water heater, heat pump dryer. That's kind of just things you might be doing anyway. Uh, we worked with Sophia and she was great, kind of helping us through the process and pushing us along. Um, so yeah, that was the big turning point, like in our project was getting rid of that steam boiler and switching over to a heat pump. And that, that really hurt our schedule though. All our permitting was based on keeping a steam boiler and the city of Chicago, it took like 12 weeks just to get that revision through, which really slowed us down in the process. But I think it was the right decision once we got into the project. So that would just be one bit of advice. Uh, you know, if you can get all those decisions done up front, um, definitely your, your project would be streamlined a lot. Um, and we went with a, a Bosch uh, ducted heat pump, and that's a Honeywell ERV on the right. Um, and I, if I could do it over again, I might try to go with a non-ducted system. Uh, just the bids that I got in and all the costs, it was a little more cost effective to go ducted for our project. And um, from the research I've done, it's not always best to combine your ventilation with your heating because they might be called for at different times. Um, our system is probably not ideal and we'll see how it works, works out. We just moved in. Uh, we're anxious to try it out. Uh, but our, our ventilation and heating and cooling is all in one system in one ductwork network. So there might be pros to having those separated, but this is what we ended up doing. Just said kind of a couple of cool things we found in the renovation. Um, someone put a, a calendar in, in the walls when we were renovating from October 12th, 1914. And a uh, cool cigarette uh, packet, probably from the same time as well. So we had to do a, a little bit of underpinning. Uh, we're right next to the, river, the north branch of the river in Lincoln Square uh, by Horner Park. And uh, we definitely had kind of a mucky um, soil and we were going down. We didn't have a whole lot of a footing. So we had to do a little bit of underpinning, a new steel beam, new columns, and kind of work in sections around the, around the basement. And like the photo that uh, Tom showed, uh, ideally we did not have quite enough room to get that two inches of rigid. And um, we just put down like a foil. So my basement is probably not as efficient as it could be. And if this was new construction, I, I'm actually in roofing and waterproofing. We would be waterproofing the outside of the foundation. But in renovation, it's too costly to dig a big hole around the outside of your house. So you're treating everything from the inside, assuming that the wall is gonna leak. Uh, that's a dimple drain board connected to uh, a trench drain or a, a burrito drain that goes to a sump pump. So you assume that it's going to let water in and then you control the water once it gets inside your, your envelope and then bring it to a sump pump that goes to the sewer. And, um, and just a vapor barrier uh, down over uh, two inches of gravel. And I do have radiant, but then 
there's also um, an air source heat pump. So that was a lot of research that we did too. There are some systems out there that are uh, heat pumps that'll do radiant in addition to air. Uh, there was a company out of Canada called Arctic and a company out of Virginia called Chiltrix. I really looked into those systems heavily and they would have been much more efficient designs for me, but it added ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 to my budget and just, I couldn't end up doing it. So I, I have an electric boiler heating the slab, uh, but hopefully this is kind of secondary and the, the Bosch heat pump is carrying the lion's share of the load and that electric boiler is, is not used that much. But in a perfect world, maybe there's one heat pump controlling all these systems. Uh, we did our roof too. It was a leaky old roof. Uh, we just put down a mod bit roof over two inches of rigid. And then we did have um, two inches of a closed cell on the underside of the sheathing, followed by eight inches of open cell. So I, I think we got about R49 in the roof. Our parapets were shot too. Uh, we had to redo our parapets. And it's a typical two flat or flat roof Chicago design where you have a drop ceiling and then a sloped roof. And you have about three feet of cavity at the front of the house. And then it tapers down to maybe 11, 12 inches at the back. So we were tight at the back of the house. And then we had a little gap at the front. That, that's the cavity at the front. Um, and then we just, you know, demoed everything out, all the old lath and plaster. I, I love to keep all that old stuff. I love the old trim. You know, the wood floor had a lot of life left in it. It would probably last another hundred years, uh, but it was just too difficult to kind of piece everything together with the new layout and just easier to take it out. I wish there'd be a way to upgrade the envelope um, without having to just remove all these old materials that might have a little more life left in them. So we studded out about an inch off the bricks and I did a, a ton of research on different insulation types. Um, if we weren't brick, if we were all stud frame, I probably would have gone with a cellulose or a non-foam material. I read all the building science articles and you know, research the pros and cons of everything and ended up settling on kind of a flash and bat approach where uh, just an inch of closed cell that would be continuous behind the studs followed by um, uh, blown in cellulose on the walls. The roof, we had to stick with all um, foam and I also did that in the basement, spray foam, but we did the flash and bat on all the walls, which kind of seals and creates an air, air barrier directly against the brick and controls your dew point. And then you're limiting the amount of foam and have, have the cellulose filling up the rest of the stud, stud bay. And that's just the closed cell going in the, uh, in the basement. We chose to go with metal studs uh, for the basement. We got kind of crushed with the lumber pricing I mean, luckily we weren't framing an entire house, but it was still probably four times more than we budgeted, just the limited amount of wood that we had uh, on the first floor and the second floor. And then we, we had an enclosed porch. So uh, kind of like what Tom was mentioning on the foam on the outside, uh, this was a stud wall. We ended up going just with extruded polystyrene and taping the seams. And then we used open cell on the inside of the two by fours. I just, I had a quick video of my drywall guys. These guys were the toughest dudes I've seen in a long time. I helped them out. I tried to help with costs uh, by saving um, a little bit of labor. And those four by eight, five eighths inch drywall were super heavy. I was sore for about two weeks and those guys just picked them up, <laughs> walked them right up the stairs and handed them off. They did that work all day. They were pretty strong guys. So we got drywall, we got primed um, and I ended up using a uh, arrow barrier to uh, get under the, the requirement for 
um, the, the air bear requirement is under one ACH. And uh, we used uh, Windy City air sealing. Um, Kevin Schaefer will spray out a mist inside the house that can seal up all the gaps. And we were at about 2.8 uh, ACH with the spray foam and the flash and bat. And then after we did the aero barrier, we got down to 0.8. And it, I, I found it just really good at finding all the weak links in your house. You could see it kind of poofing out of the chimney or, or poofing out of a window. Our windows were only about uh, 10 years, eight years old. So that was an expense we kind of saved is not replacing our windows, but you could kind of see the weak link maybe where I had a couple seals that were bad. So aero barrier was a pretty easy way just to kind of get down to that last um, air tightness. So uh, we, we put in new wood floors. I, I would have loved to save the old floors, but again, uh, it was just kind of too difficult to, to salvage it. So did have to splurge some, for some new flooring. In the basement, we just kept the slab and uh, polished it. It's kind of more of an industrial look, but didn't have any, any other flooring down in the basement. And kind of some of the same things that Tom had, um, the ream, uh, hot water tank, and there's, there's no venting we have to put in. It just kind of does its thing without a out of flu, and um, and then we went with a whirlpool uh, uh, ventless uh, dryer. That's a heat pump, and that is a great thing. Not having that gas bill, they charge you thirty five bucks a month just to uh, ha have a connection without even using any gas. And we had two of them in a two flat, so that's seventy bucks a month right there, just with um, not having that connection. Um, so this is our, our basement unit that we're going to rent out. It's just kind of a studio, uh, probably just a single person, um, about 900 square feet. And then our, um, we have three bedrooms. It's a pretty modest size. You know, these aren't really big buildings. Uh, we did get a big, pretty big closet, which we're fortunate with that uh, enclosed porch in the back. And uh, we did put in a wood-burning stove just as kind of a, a safety. I think that Bosch unit is rated down to 12 degrees. And then we have a backup resistant heat if we have another polar vortex. But I just like having that wood-burning stove if, you know, it's fun to have a fire. And then if everything else fails, we've got a, if the grid goes down, we've got a stove. And we ran a conduit to the roof for solar in the future. We kind of ran out of money, but if we, we have the ability to run that conduit up in the future and add solar to help with our, our energy needs. And if any, anything I can help with, I, I definitely learned a lot in this process. Um, everyone else on this call probably has a ton more knowledge than me, but I called contractors and architects and envelope consultants, and a lot of people were certainly helpful in the process. So. Anything I can help with in the future for anyone considering it, be happy to share my experience. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, and Tom, if you want to come back on video, it looks like we have about 20 minutes for questions. So if people still have questions, keep putting them in the chat and we will try to get through as many as we can. So starting off, let's see. We got this question a few times, Tom, for you, and I think you might have answered it in the chat, but just so everyone um, gets to hear it, what software did you use for the energy modeling for your project? Yeah, we um, we do a lot of passive house projects, so we use Woofy Passive. That's the one that's available through the Passive House Institute. There's a free version that you can get, and there's also a paid version that we use because it lets us do things faster. But um, that's what we use for the overall energy modeling. It's very granular, everything about the thermal envelope, the air tightness, the windows, the appliances, the lights. Um, but then we use WriteSoft, which is a uh, like a mechanical engineering software to figure out our um, HVAC uh, loads for the manual J and manual D calculations that need to be done for duct design and sizing the mechanical equipment. 
Awesome. A lot of that is over my head. So if people have more questions, Tom's your guy. <laughs> oh, and other on top of that too, what type of air barrier did you use? Well, um, my air barrier is uh, a combination. On the walls, we used the Henry Blueskin. Um, we taped the wall sheathing down to the foundation with a Sega Wiglove tape. Um, and so the foundation as solid concrete is um, relatively airtight. Um, so basically it goes concrete, uh, foundation and foundation walls, transitions out to the Henry Blueskin. And then my roof has been all spray foamed and um, I'm connecting the arrow, the, sorry, the, the blue skin at the top to my spray foam insulation that's sticking out of the eaves. Now, I don't know how good it's going to be. Um, and if we need to fix it, I mean, we'll get a blower door test and find out if it's just visible leaks that we can plug and we, uh, accessible leaks that we can plug. And if it's not, we'll probably do what Jeff did, which is get arrow barrier out here and pressurize the house and, and, and blow it. But that's a mess because we're living in the house. And so that means we have to cover everything or remove everything. And that's, I'm hoping we don't have to do that. See. Yeah, I hope not for your, for your sake too. <laughs> You're already dealing with 90 degrees and no AC, so. <laughs> Jeff, question for you, is the heat pump system that you use, is it all ducted for heating and cooling? Yeah. That's the primary system, it, it does everything. Awesome, and a few questions just about going electric in general. And so either of you can answer um, the next few. Let's see, how much, how much can someone change to electric appliances from gas without um, upgrading their electric service? Sorry, can you read that again, Kellen? Yes, and this was from Chris. How much can I change to electric appliances from gas without upgrading my electric service or electric panel? Oh, wow. It totally depends on what you have. If you have a 60 amp service or you have a 100 amp service or you have a 200 amp service, I mean, it, it depends on where you're at. Um, I'll say that the, the water heater, I don't think is a really big draw, but the induction stove is, it kind of peaks, you know, and, um, and the mini split system is the biggest. Um, so it depends on, on where you're at and what you're going to. And this is one of the tricky things. How did you figure, Jeff, did you just, just go with the 200 amp panel or did you have somebody calculate it for you? What you need service wise? We had two units. So we had two 200 amps. Um, if not, we would probably have to go to 400 amp, my electrician said. So for anyone, around. oh yeah, that would be great, Tom. I was gonna say for anyone, consult your electrician. They can help you. Yeah, my electrician said he needed to hire somebody to, uh, hang on. I gotta bring my, gotta bring my audio with me. <laughs> this is, this is, um, okay, here we go. So um, I just wanted to, to walk over here because my, my heat pump water heater just turned on. Um, and I don't know how well you can hear this. But this is one of the things that people complain about. Can you hear it running? Just barely, honestly. Barely at all. So this little guy is a fan here uh, blowing, blowing out. Um, and and that's the heat pump unit sitting on top. But this is just something to keep in mind. If you, uh, if you put a heat pump water heater right next to your bedroom, you're gonna hear it. So um, gas water heaters, you know, you just hear the, the gas kicking on and that's usually about it. Um, the heat pump water heaters make a little bit of noise. So that's something to think about. The other thing that they do, they take heat out of the air and they're, that's blowing cool air right now. So that's my, the only air conditioner I have in the house. Um, and uh, actually, I, I got a window unit upstairs, but um, but that's another thing to think about. In the winter time, it's it's blowing a little bit of cold air into your house, so it's not it's not ideal. But if you look at the energy picture, if you're providing 
the heating in an efficient way, like with mini slicks, then on balance, you're, you're doing fine because uh, our biggest load is heating, not cooling. Sorry, just going off script there. No, that, that was great timing that it kicked in. This is a great question about Chicago in specific. So does Chicago building code still require a redundant heat source if you use a heat bump um, due to the rating of heat pumps sometimes being at a minimum of negative 15 and sometimes unfortunately it gets colder than that here? I'll jump in on that one. You know, it's interesting. I just came across that issue um, on a, a, a forum that I was on online I don't know about the Chicago code. I haven't done enough projects in Chicago to know the answer to that. Um, but I just want to say that um, backup heat sources, that this, this is the issue, our backup heat source is required. Um, we've done a number of passive houses and in the last polar vortex, and they're all just heated with heat pumps, last polar vortex, um, out of six of them, like Two of them, the mini split shut off. It went below 20 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 20 Fahrenheit. Um, so these are cold climate heat pumps. This is something you got to know. There's heat pumps and there's cold climate heat pumps. And so the Mitsubishi system that I'm using will deliver something like 80% of its rated capacity at seven below Fahrenheit. And it's still putting out heat at 15 below, 17 below. Um, its capacity drops off. So you want to be careful about the sizing of the system. If you need 24,000 BTU hour, um, don't buy a 24,000 BTU hour unit, buy a 30,000 BTU hour unit, because when it's 20, when it's 10 below outside, it's not going to give you 24,000 BTUs. So um, just something to look at and think about. Um, but, but most of them didn't shut off at all. So the question of backup heating is, um, is one not only of code, but also is it a good idea? I mean, I think Jeff, the wood the wood stove or pellet stove is, is great. It's nice to have that alternative. Um, and we encourage it with our clients, but um, I don't have a backup heat source other than, than uh, space heaters if I ever need them. I thought about installing it in the system, but I talked to my HVAC contractor. He's like, I don't think he'll ever need it. I've, he's been doing this for 15 years and I know that it can happen, but you know, we're gonna, we'll, we'll let you know. We'll, we'll check back in February. <laughs> I know our inspector just really looked at the heat loss calcs with the, the BTU of the equipment. He just matched everything up and wanted to make sure there was enough BTUs with the heat loss calc, but he wasn't looking at any backup requirements for the heat pump. Jeff, another question. I think it, it seems like you did quite a bit of research on um, choosing your systems, ductless, ducted. So there was a question asking you to elaborate more on the ducted versus ductless systems. Kind of what are the pros and cons of combining heating and cooling? I mean, I, I'm not an expert by any means. Uh, Tom would probably answer better. I just, uh, like Green Building Advisor is a great resource. And there's a lot of... Um, <clears throat> a lot of articles that just talk about there might be times when your heating or cooling is not called for, but you still want ventilation. And like Zender is one of the leaders in ventilation, and it's a totally separate system than your heating and cooling ductwork. And I, I think that is the ultimate, is you can have ventilation in your home, and maybe you don't need heating or cooling at the same time. So those two systems can operate individually, my system probably still works okay and it's all on the same ductwork and it's still providing some ventilation. It's probably just not, not the ideal design. But I, I, save, I save some money going that way. Yeah, I mean, the, the, what I've heard from everybody is like, if you can do separate standalone ducted systems, that's ideal. Um, and I definitely prefer ducted heating and cooling instead of ductless, especially in buildings in this climate that are drawn out because you won't get good mixing of, of air otherwise. You'll get rooms on the east side that are cold in the afternoon and you know, vice versa. So um, 
So the ideal is to have two separate duct systems. Um, I didn't do that, and I haven't done, and I've and I've avoided it on a lot of our high performance houses. Um, what I've got here, and I'll just flip around because I'm I'm here. I might as well just point at it. Um, so you're looking at the the ventilation system here, my serve, right? And so I've ducted the exhaust from all my places where I make indoor pollutants and, and moisture. So the kitchen, the bathrooms, and the, um, and the laundry. And the returns come to the ERV and, you know, goes out the side of the house. And then the fresh air comes in, and that's where the ducting can get more complicated. I could duct the fresh air to all my rooms, or in this case, um, if you can see, well, basically, it's just a bunch of silver ductwork. But it comes over and it dumps into the return side of my air handler for the, um, for the house. And so that way I can use the house air handler to distribute the fresh air, whether the house air handler is working or not, because, because the house air handler can work in fan only mode. It doesn't have to be cooling or heating. And so there's an interconnect that they make between the ventilator and the air handler um, that says when I'm ventilating, I need that fan on. And so it just distributes the air. And the serve is really amazing because it moves a fair amount of air around all the time, but it has a, it has a sensor in the return side of the unit to detect VOCs and CO2. And if it detects that there's a lot of that or whatever point that you set, like start ventilating at 900 parts per million CO2, then, um, then it starts bringing in fresh air. So it's demand controlled ventilation, which is really ideal. Um, so that, so it, it'll be like breathing all the time in my house, but it'll know when it has to breathe in more fresh air to exhaust. Like when we all come in and it's dinner time, we start cooking, boom, it'll up the ventilation. So, um, but anyway, we're using the, the conditioning ductwork for most of the, the fresh air distribution. Related to that, I see a chat that just or a question that just came into the chat from Jan. So, to achieve just plain ventilation without either heating or cooling, do you consider simply opening windows for cross ventilation? Yeah, I mean, the the thing is that in the middle of the winter, that doesn't work so well. I mean, it works. It works. It brings fresh air in, but it's a huge energy loss. Um, but yeah, I mean, we don't, yeah, whenever we can open the windows, we do, cause we like to hear the birds and feel the breeze. Um, but, but the problem with the old traditional model is that you're going to have really bad air quality in the winter time, or you're going to be uncomfortable, or you're just going to use a ton of energy. So with ERVs, um, you get efficient way to, to keep really good air quality, great air quality, better than than traditionally it used to be in fact. I've, I've noticed too, when it's been real humid the last month, the heat pump has been good at dehumidification. I've been at about 42% in my place. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I crack the window, I watched that humidistat go up to about 70%. Um, so I, I would always love to have windows open. And I used to live in Colorado and it cools down at night, uh, but with the humidity, and then the cold temps, um, the, the heat pump does all that work. Thank you to you both. Uh, switching gears a little bit. I'm, so good question from Karen. Interested in further discussion regarding retrofit uh, versus tear down and, and rebuild, especially if a major remodel or total gut was in the cards anyway. Obviously, you both talked about retrofits on this presentation, but uh, curious your thoughts there. What do you think, Jeff? I mean, anytime you can use an existing structure, I mean, especially with what lumber prices have done recently, it seems like that's a big win um, if that structure works with your design goals. I mean, mine was brick um, and they're not, you know, brick isn't getting built much anymore. And, um, you know, keeping up with the tuck pointing and maintaining that old structure, it should last hopefully another hundred years. So I think our old housing stock 
and Chicago's full of it, um, should should last a long time if if you can make your new design work with it. Yeah, it. I mean, it. Your 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 house looks great, and I'm so glad you kept it and you did what you did. I mean, you took care of the whole thing, and you maintained a piece of our culture. You know, and um, I, I guess there's there's the cultural aspect, and then there's also the embodied energy. And so when people are looking at the energy efficiency side of things, um, and you look at, you, you know, we're not we're not going to solve the um, the kind of climate problem, it, it, it sort of the emissions problem with buildings by tearing down old buildings and building new ones. Um, if we try to do that, we're going to use a huge amount of energy in the short term to create those materials and to tear the old materials down and to cart them to the dump. Um, so. So yeah, whenever you can renovate, uh, that's the better way to go because just from the embodied energy standpoint. But I recognize that there are times that there are fire damaged buildings or there's a foundation that needs to be rebuilt um, or there's, you know, there's, there, there are a lot of things that can make it start to get really questionable really fast. <laughs> so, you know, I get that. And also like the shape of the building is totally wrong for, for what we need here. It was a it was built as a store in 1911 and, you know, we need it as a house in 2021. So, um, so yeah, I, I mean, it, th there are times that can happen, but I would just say whenever you can keep it, keep it. And um, you know what, it's really fun for me. Uh, it's been fun on this house to think about, you know, the, 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 the characterful elements of this house that we can kind of maintain and, and to play with that and do, to do some really modern things and have that contrast going on is to me, it's kind of exciting. Awesome. Well, I know we just have a few minutes left. We haven't gotten through all the questions, but they will be sent out after this because I want to give both Tom and Jeff uh, a few moments to just share any last thoughts, words of inspiration, anything you want to share with folks on the webinar here. Mm. Big Go ahead. Putting you on the spot. <laughs> if you're ready, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't do this for my living full time. It's, um, I'm kind of glad it's over. It's a lot of work. Um, it's really fun. I, I really enjoy it. And um, it's where we live. It's where we spend all of our time. And um, I, I kind of want to do another project because I learned a lot. I just maybe want to wait a couple of years and get, <laughs> get it past this one. Um, I just, yeah, it's just finding it, finding a good team, like, like anything in life, it's the team that you have and, uh, you know, someone like Tom and, uh, good tradesmen finding good subs, um, is, uh, is the key to a successful project. So I definitely learned a lot and, um, there's, there's always improvements you can make. Yeah. I'd love to pick up on that. Uh, that team uh, thing, Jeff, there, which is that one of the real benefits of uh, speeding up retrofits is that it, it creates local jobs. It has to, because you have to be working in your locality. Um, electricians, carpenters, insulators. Um, and, and I really hope that we can uh, inspire some young people to enter the trades and the engineering and design professions to really jump on this. Um, and, and, you know, find a sense of meaning and like, yeah, I'm, I'm taking this old building stock and I'm making something which is going to help preserve our, our, our life here on earth. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's where we're at with this. So, um, so anyway, I, I just, uh, I, I feel like we need this young blood that's inspired to come in and, and really just, just go after it. So um, it is, it, the, the final thing I'll say is that there, I, I do have a nice feeling about this project in, uh, in Jeff, I feel like you were kind of hinting towards this is a feeling like I'm taking care of this house, kind of like I'm taking care of my kids, you know, it's like, I, I have a stewardship sense, you know, like, this poor old thing, you know, it needed a bath. And so, so 
and some bandages and a trip to the ER. But anyway, so we're doing it all. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's it's taking it's taking care of what we got. Thank you so much, Jeff and Tom, for sharing your stories with us. Um, wonderful, wonderful to hear. And, and thank you for answering all the questions. There's about 20 more that we probably didn't get to. So we'll add them to a Q&A document, as Kellen mentioned in the chat. Um, but really appreciate your time and your willingness to share what you've been doing at your homes. Um, Kellen and Sophia, thank you so much to the Comet Energy Efficiency Program for um, uh, sponsoring the tour and hosting this event today. Um, it's such a great program, and I hope a lot of people learned about this program as well. We'll share links to the chat. I'm sorry, links to the ComEd program. I'm in the follow-up email as well, if you didn't grab them, um, as well as a recording. Um, and that cool list of links Tom had earlier today uh, in his presentation, too. So thank you again to everyone. Our next session is on September 8th. Um, it's a Green Home Upgrades Ask the Expert session. So we'll have um, actually, the key author of a DIY um, uh, electrifying your home guide, um, which is pretty exciting, Sean Armstrong, as well as some um, some professionals that are working in the field. So, uh, you know, mechanical contractor, electrician, um, home inspector, kind of people that we can ask the questions about how to do these things in Chicago. Um, so come with your questions to that session as well. Thank you again to our partners, our sponsors, and our speakers. Um, and we'll see you next time. Have a good one.